this a quadratic ax squared plus bx plus c is a polynomial degree 2, right? If a is positive, right, it's a degree 2, so it's going to be have this kind of overall shape, right? p has an even degree. Uh, and depending on if the le leading coefficient is positive or if it's negative, right, that'll determine the end behavior. So how we summarize the end behavior is, well, if we're talking about an even degree, let's focus on the even degree for a little bit here, with a, a positive coefficient, well, then we get this type of end behavior. Depending on what the degree is and how many other x's you have, there could be a lot of activity going on in here. That doesn't matter, as long as we know the overall behavior of this thing. So as x goes to negative infinity, y is going to positive infinity, right? So as I move out in the negative direction on my x-axis, things are going up, 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 up. Same thing here, as I'm moving x out into positive infinity, y is also going to positive infinity. So these, all these little blurbs are showing us the end behavior. So here, I'll say, oop. Uh, this is how we summarize the end behavior. of a polynomial. Okay. So these little guys are just the summaries of the end behavior. And we talk about as x goes to negative infinity or x goes to positive infinity, y can either go to positive or negative infinity depending on which way it's going. All right, and so if we talk about this, so if we have an odd degree, we know we're kind of going like this in our general graph. If we have a negative coefficient, it kind of switches direction, right? Um, and we get this overall shape. This is for any odd degree. So let's say we have a, a degree 15. We have a, a power of 14, 13, 12, whatever in here. That's going to affect the, the middle section, but not the end behavior. So the highest power in our polynomial is what determines the end behavior of this thing. And so that's what I want you to take away from, from this section, okay? Because we're not going to graph any of these explicitly. Uh, let's talk about just some fun things here. These all mean the same thing. So if P is a polynomial and C is a real number, then the following are equivalent, right? So I'll highlight that they're equivalent, meaning they're the same thing. C is a zero of P. A zero means uh, it's, it's a solution for, for where it equals zero, so where it crosses the X axis. So a zero, is where it crosses the x-axis, right? Where f of x is equal to zero is where it comes from, which also makes it a, so therefore the x-intercept is c. So c is a zero is telling us that, hey, this is where it crosses the x-axis and which makes it an x-intercept, which actually comes into play here. So all these things are saying the same thing, and we've used some of them already. x equals c is a solution of the equation p of x equals zero. That's what we use to factor quadratics when we use the quadratic formula, right? We found the values of x that make it zero, and then we said x minus c, so if we had c here, x minus c is a factor of p of x. So that's what we used um, when we factored, so 
And we use these facts to factor quadratics using the quadratic equation, using the quadratic equation in 1.5, or I should say in section 1.5. So we've already used these, but all of these meaning the same thing is kind of useful, right? And so uh, we need to know our way around these that we know some of them already. And these are going to come back up later in the next section too, so don't worry. The intermediate value theorem is just kind of an interesting one. Uh, it's not something that we need to kind of use that often, but um, the intermediate value theorem comes up in, um, in calculus as well. So if you do plan on keep to keep going into calculus, which is a good idea, um, you'll hear about the intermediate value theorem. The intermediate value theorem is kind of weird because it's pretty obvious, right? But if it says that if you have two points A and B and the outputs of these points are of opposite signs. So in this case, P of A is negative, P of B is positive. What that says is that there must exist some point C between A and B where this thing is zero, right? So that's the intermediate value theorem. It's not that uh, pretty revolutionary when it came out, uh, when someone was like, hey, let's establish this. But it makes sense, right? So if you've got an output that's negative and an output that's positive, at some point, the output should be zero, right? Assuming that you have a polynomial, which is a continuum, um, but a polynomial function, then it's going to have this property that if you've got a negative and a positive output, somewhere in between those, you have a zero output. Okay. So on the next page of these notes, um, we're just going to talk about these, but I just want to emphasize that we're not graphing any of these. We've done a lot of this work already, so I want to highlight that. Uh, but I'll save your, your graphing powers for uh, quadratics, which we just did, and for uh, rational functions. So, there we go. Okay. We will not graph polynomials, okay. but here are the steps. Well, a quadratic we just said is a polynomial, so we will be graphing quadratics. Um, I guess I should say that except quadratics. Okay. So first thing you have to do is you have to find where it crosses the x-axis. So find the zeros, which means you have to factor the polynomial and find all its zeros. Uh, so these are the x-intercepts. We did this back in inequalities where we had to figure out um, where a function was zero. So we had to factor all the factors out and then we had to evaluate. So then we had to use test points. So you make a table of values and you figure out where this thing is positive or negative, meaning where is it above the x-axis, where is it below? And then you determine the end behavior of the graph that you're expecting to see and then you can do a rough graph of this thing. So we actually did this um,
we did this with inequalities, in section 1.8. Long time. Okay. So if we just zoom in and look, if I've got something like, oops, x minus 2 to the power of 5, well, x minus 2 is a factor, and when we have the 5 to the power of 5, we say it's of multiplicity 5. So that's what we're talking about here. Um, if you have an odd multiplicity, then of course this thing is, is odd, so whether it's positive or negative, um, it means that at, uh, at C, at this zero, it's gonna cross the x-axis. Whereas if m is even, then you've got a parabola, so at the zero, it's going to be um, either above or below, but kind of going up and including that point. I'll include this last little blip. Okay, so uh, here, the multiplicity, so if zero, so if C is a zero of P, meaning C is uh, a, a, an x-intercept of multiplicity M, then the shape of the graph of P near C is as follows. So if M is odd, then at C, you're gonna be crossing the x-axis. Uh, same thing if it's odd but negative. If it's positive, or sorry, if it's even and positive, then um, it's going to be touching that point, but only both of them are growing, going up. And then same thing with the other one. So let me just grab an example here. So let's just highlight here. Uh, this is multiplicity m is 5, so it's odd, okay? We've got a, ne uh, a negative odd multiplicity. So here, um, if it's negative, it's going to look like this, right? And the multiplicity is odd, so it's going to have this general shape, okay? Not something that I need you to worry about, but I just wanted to have it, okay? So like I said, a little bit quick through uh, this section, but that's because I want to get to the next section. Are there any questions though before we do? Okay, so I'll start on a new page here. Section 3.3 is on dividing polynomials. Dividing polynomials. So if I've got a polynomial divided by a polynomial, I need to know how to deal with that. And so one, one time that that could be useful is if you have to factor out a specific factor um, from this thing. That might be useful, right? Uh, so even if, if you can't see that factor explicitly, what we can do is we can use long division, and I know that's yucky and probably uh, it's been a while or never since you did long division. But uh, we're going to use long division to figure out how to divide these polynomials. Okay. And so let's grab this little So if we have 
two polynomials, p of x and d of x, are polynomials, as long as d of x is not equal to zero, because what you'll see is we're taking p of x divided by d of x. So we can't divide by zero, that's still a rule. Then there exist unique polynomials q of x and r of x, uh, where r of x is either zero or of a degree less than the degree of d of x, because that's what we're dividing by. We'll deal with that later. Where we can rewrite p of x over d of x as q of x plus r of x over d of x. Or if you, um, if you brought this d of x over and you multiplied it through, you would get p of x as d of x times q of x plus r of x. So let's establish some, uh, some terminology here. So p of x is the dividend, okay, or the dividend, but I'm going to call it the dividend. d of x is the divisor. So you've got the dividend over the divisor. The quotient is q of x and r of x is the remainder. So p of x over d of x is the same as the dividend over the divisor. Which is going to be q of x is the quotient, as we call it, and r of x is the remainder. So we're going to use these, uh, and they're Two, two established ways that we can find uh, q of x and r of x. The notes go through long division and synthetic division. I actually prefer the long division. Synthetic division, you're welcome to read it and try it. If you like it and it makes sense to you, go ahead and use it. I just want to simplify things a little bit. So I like the long division. To me, it makes more sense. I, I think it looks better, um, but that's just personal preference. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the long division, we're going to work through it. Okay. But I just want to make a note that if you prefer the, the synthetic division, go ahead and use it. It doesn't matter. You're going to find the same answers, right? If you're doing it properly. There are two ways. There are two ways to find q of x and r of x. The first way is by long division. Long division of polynomials. I will use this way or this method so we're not getting away from anything here. Which is outlined in the notes. So we're not going to do it, but we're just going to use long division just to keep things simple. Trust me, it's going to be hard as hard enough as it is. Okay. Long division of polynomials. Okay. Uh, I guess what I did last class was I just went through uh, this example but that doesn't stop this example here. So what I want to do is let's go through three together as an example. So long division of polynomials by example, step by step. So we'll use uh, use three question three here. <clears throat> so we've got p of x over d of x. So we're given p of x and d of x. Our job is to find q of x and r of x. Q 
of x being the quotient, r of x being the remainder. Okay. So here, 3. All right. P of x, let's write them down, is 2x squared minus 5x minus 7. D of x is x minus 2. All right. So what we've got is essentially we want to find 2x squared minus 5x minus 7 divided by x minus 2. All right. So uh, maybe I'll rewrite this as p of x over d of x is this over this cheating. But they're the same, right? Luckily how I wrote them out. Um, okay. Step one for long division is to write it like we used to write uh, a over b is b into a. Right? So that's how where we're going to start. So step one is to rewrite here. I'll just oops, delete this here. Step one Step one, rewrite p of x divided by d of x as d of x going into p of x. Okay. This isn't very nice looking, but p of x, and it's kind of a curved bracket. It looks a lot like a square root, but not quite, right? It's got a curved bracket and a divisor. So for our purposes here, we've got x minus 2 is being divided into 2x squared minus 5x minus 7. OK. All right. Step two, OK, these are the leading terms. Okay. So each of these has a leading term. Step two, divide the leading term of P of X by the leading term of P, D of X. Divide the leading term of P of X by the leading term of d of x. Put the result over the leading term of p of x. Place the result over over the leading term of p of x. Okay, so what does that look like? Here, I'm going to take the leading term of this guy divided by the leading term of this guy. Okay. Let me just write that out. x minus 2 going into 2x squared minus 5x minus 7. Okay. So, <clears throat> over here, I'm going to have uh, 2x squared divided by x makes 2x, which is going to go here. Okay. This up here is going to end up being our quotient. Okay. So we'll call this, oops, this up here is going to be our quotient. So what we do 
is, so we had to divide the leading term of P of X by the leading term of D of X and place the result over the leading term of P of X, okay? Then what we do is we take this result from the quotient and multiply it by D of X and place it down here. Step three, this is where it gets weird. Step three, multiply the result by D of X and place below P of X. Okay. What's going to happen is when we place these below, eventually we're going to uh, subtract, which means this first term is going to go away. So what it looks like is you get X minus 2 divided by 2 or going into 2X squared minus 5X minus 7 and up here I have 2X. So now I'm going to take 2x times x minus 2 becomes 2x squared minus 4x. And that goes here. 2x squared minus 4x. OK. What I'll do here is I'm going to add, because I'm just going to add, no, let's do it as another step. Um, now, I'm going to subtract each of these terms, right? So subtract that result, so here's the result now, from P of X. So step four. Subtract the results from P of X to create a new dividend. Okay. So this looks like x minus 2 going into 2x squared minus 5x minus 7 is 2x and then we've got 2x squared minus 4x. So what we're doing here is we have to subtract this thing. 2x squared minus 2x squared, just like we were saying before, the whole point is for that term to go away so that we're constantly chipping away at this thing and making it smaller and smaller. And then negative 5x minus negative 4x. So it's really important that you bring this negative inside. So negative 5 plus 4x puts us at minus x. And then technically negative 7 minus 0 is negative 7. So you want to bring all, all these terms down. Don't forget about those. So now what we do is we, we take this thing and divide it into here, right? Negative x uh, divided by x, negative 1. Okay. And so now this is going to be... Uh, your new dividend oops i've been using likely haven't i step five repeat the procedure with the new dividend repeat the procedure with the new dividend. Okay. So what do we get here? I'll just copy out everything that we've done so far. X minus two going into two X squared minus five X minus seven. We've already established two X minus 
2x squared minus 4x, which was 0 minus x minus 7. Okay, so now I'm just going to use a different color here and finish this off because now I take negative x, whoops, negative x, I'll use a different color, negative x divided by x is negative 1, which goes over here, minus 1. Step 2 is I'm going to take this negative 1 times x minus 2 and place it down here. So negative 1 times x minus 2 makes negative x plus 2, which goes down here. Then I'm going to subtract this thing. Oops. And sure. So I get negative x plus x is 0. Negative 7 minus 2 is minus 9. Oh, okay, here is our quotient, 2x minus 1. So this is going to be q of x. Uh, let's see if I have a color I haven't used yet. q of x, oh, it's not a very good color, is it? And here, this is our r of x is negative 9. Once you don't have any x's to divide anymore, you stop. You're done, right? Whatever is left over is the remainder. Step 6, let's call it continue until the new dividend Uh, has a lesser degree than d of x. Okay. Whatever is remaining is r of x. Whatever is remaining is r of x and Everything on top is q of x. And everything up top is q of x. Okay, so that was our goal, to be able to find q of x and r of x. It's going to involve long division. You have to practice these um, to get really good at them. Before we do another one, I want to introduce the factor and the remainder theorem. They're on the next page and then we'll come back and we'll do some more examples and we'll keep doing a couple more examples next day just as review. So, but I want to go through the factor and the remainder theorem. The remainder theorem is a little bit cooler than the factor theorem, but we have to cover both. So the remainder and the factor theorem. So the remainder theorem, I guess uh, I don't need that part. I just need this. Let's put it here. So the remainder theorem says that if you have a polynomial P of X, okay, and it's divided by something like X minus C. So notice that it has to have this special form, then the remainder that you found is actually going to be the polynomial evaluated at C. Okay. So that's kind of weird. Why would we care? Well, if P of X is huge and it's easier to do long division and do X minus C, then I also know what P, is, P of X is evaluated at C. Notice that it has to be x minus c. So what this is saying is that if you have p of x divided by x minus c, right? 
then p of c is equal to r of x. Okay, that's kind of weird, right? p is evaluated at um, c is equal to the remainder. But that's just the, that's the remainder theorem. So if the polynomial is divided by x minus c, notice that it has to have this special shape. So it must be in this form. Okay. So for example, that is if p of x is divided by x plus 4, c is negative 4. Right, so just be careful if you have x plus 4, you have to change it so c is equal to negative 4. So once you have the remainder, in our case, in the previous case here, the remainder is negative 9. So what this is saying is that if the remainder is negative 9, we have a shortcut to evaluate p at c and luckily for us, we were doing x minus 2, so c is 2. So what we should find is that p, the original p, 2x squared minus 5x minus 7, evaluated at 2, should be equal to negative 9. Okay, so I'll write that down. Using the previous example, we found p of x was, where was it, 2x squared minus 5x minus 7. p of x was x minus 2. q of x, just for completeness, ended up being 2x minus 1. And r of x was negative 9. The remainder theorem, just to apply the remainder theorem here, the remainder theorem says that if I plug in 2 into p of x, right, so here uh, x minus c, so c must be 2 in this case, p evaluated at 2 must be equal to negative 9 without even doing it. We're going to confirm it, right, by plugging in c or x equals 2 into this thing and make sure that we get to negative 9. So what this thing says is the remainder theorem says p at c equal to 2 equals r of x, okay. or what we'll say is just p of c. is equal to r of x, which we can confirm. p of c is p at 2. Right, we said c is equal to 2, so p of 2, which is 2x squared, so 2, 2 squared minus 5 times 2 minus 7. Two squared is 4 times 2 is 8, minus 10, minus 7. Okay. Uh, what did I do wrong here? Oh, never mind. Just some math blip. 8 minus 10, I should just use my calculator, minus 7 is negative 9. Which is our remainder. Okay. So all it's saying is that we can actually skip this and say, I know what P is at about evaluated at C, it's going to be the remainder. 
So we don't even need to evaluate it, especially if you have a huge function, a huge polynomial function, and you've already done the division, uh, and you know the remainder, well, then you know the function evaluated at C. Okay. The last kind of concept from here is the factor theorem, which is not that special at all. The factor theorem says that, okay, so C is again from X minus C. C is a zero of P, okay? Um, meaning it's the X intercept. If and only if X minus C is a factor of P of X, which is really saying that um, R of X must be zero, right? If x minus c is a factor, it has to come out clean from p of x, which means the remainder would be zero. Okay. So c is a zero, meaning a, an x-intercept. Of p, if and only if x minus c is a factor of p of x, so meaning it comes out clean so r of x must be zero. In this case, because we had a, a remainder, and I'll bump this up so we can make some room here. Wing. Of course, never mind. Therefore, since r of x equals negative 9 in the previous example. x minus 2 is not a factor here. No. What a mess. Uh, but I want to keep it on the same page. That's the problem. That's what I can do. There. Because I only need one more line. There. Took way too long. Uh, so since the remainder is not zero, right, it's not equal to zero, in the previous example, x minus 2 is not a factor of p of x. So we can use it the other way around too, it is not a factor of p of x, because it's an if and only of statement. Okay. All right, so Let's do another example before we uh, leave today. And then what I want you to do is I want you to do as many of these as you can on your own. And then uh, let me know which ones you found hard and we can work through those for review next day. work through as many of these as you can for next day. And uh, bring the ones you want us to go through for review. Now, of course, if you don't bring me any, I'll probably just pick, you know, what looks to be the hardest one here uh, and probably another one just to emphasize things, but uh, the ones you want us to go over for review. Okay. How about, uh, let's do one, how about we do five? 
So we've done, which one did we just do? We did three, let's do five. Uh, where's the link from this Okay. So let's do five together. Five says p of x is 4x squared minus 3x minus 7. And d of x is 2x minus 1. Okay. So let's go through and we're just going to work through these. I'll go a little bit slow still, but you've got the step by step broken down. So I'll, I'll still kind of highlight what's going on here. Oh, before that. Um, sorry, make sure we're still, okay, we're still good. I was getting a phone call and it messes everything up. So, um, if we've got, oops, 2x minus 1 has to go into 4x squared minus 3x minus 7. Okay. First thing we have to do is divide the leading, uh, the leading terms. So over here, and I'll scoot this over just a little bit, make some room here. I have to do 4x squared divided by 2x, which is going to be 4 divided by 2 is 2x squared divided by x is x. So I get 2x, which is going to go here. I'll label this as my first thing I'm doing. So 2x. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 2x times 2x minus 1, right? I need to bring this back downstairs. So 2x, 2x times 2x minus 1 makes 4x squared minus 2x. So this is my second step, and it has to go here. So I get 4x squared minus 2x. Third thing I need to do is I need to subtract these things. Okay. This leading term should go away, right? If we've done things properly, it should go away. 4x, minus 4, uh, 4x squared minus 4x squared is 0. Negative 3x minus negative 2x, so that's plus 2x, puts me at minus 1x, or just minus x. Negative 7 minus 0 puts me at minus 7. Now I do the exact same thing all over again with negative x minus 7 as my dividend. So I'm going to start over here. Oh, uh, not my third, my fourth step. Negative x divided by 2x is negative 1 half. So this goes minus 1 half. A little bit nasty because it's got the um, fraction, but that's OK. So now my second, or kind of, I guess my fifth step is to take the negative 1 half times 2x minus 1. This becomes negative 2 over 2x, which is going to be just negative 1x or negative x. Negative 1 half times negative 1 is just 1 half, so plus 1 over 2. So here, this one was actually harder than I thought with the fraction. Uh, I get negative x plus 1 half. Then my sixth step is to subtract these again. Oopsies. Negative x minus negative x makes zero. Negative seven 
minus one half makes six and a half. Uh, if I want to convert it to fractions, I'd have to put seven over two, so 14 over two. So negative 14 over two minus one half makes, I'll just write it out here, negative seven times two over two minus one over two is gonna be <clears throat> negative 14 minus 1, negative 15 divided by 2. Okay. This is our remainder, just a little bit worse than I, I anticipated. 15 divided by 2, is that right? Negative 7 minus 0.5, yep, negative 15 divided by 2, negative 7.5. I did it wrong earlier. So therefore, Q of X, Q of X is 2X minus 1 half, and R of X is negative 15 over 2. Oops, 1 half, and R of X is negative 15 divided by 2. And I would just keep those as uh, in exact form. First step we can write, write as P of X over D of X is Q of X is equal or um, plus R of X over D of X. In this case, right, you just plug in Q of X, R of X and D of X and you have the answer, um, or you can write, or P of X is equal to, so all I'm doing is multiplying D of X over on both, uh, both terms here. So it's gonna be Q of X, D of X. So D of X, Q of X plus R of X. But I'll save that for next day because I'm all out of time. I don't want to keep you guys. Okay, so definitely work through some of these uh, and I'll post the solutions so that you have them so you can check because um, some of them can be kind of tricky. But there's lots of online calculators that you can use to check your work too, so don't worry. Just don't worry, you, you should be checking your work online. Um, go through as many of these as you can and I'll see you on Thursday if you don't have any questions. I'll stop the recording. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Bye. you.